Hi guys, as I showed in a short recently, I've got this 256 by 256 animated hardware sprite working with my VGA circuit, uh, driven by a 6502 program, and in this video I'm going to give all the details. I'll discuss the general concept, show the specific schematic for this demo, and talk you through the process of building and testing it, as there were certainly quite a few issues to resolve along the way. The idea behind hardware sprites is that rather than updating the frame buffer memory to move things around on the screen, the display hardware itself knows how to sample from both the main frame buffer and from an additional area of sprite memory. And it knows how to overlay the image from the second memory bank on the image from the first. So this overlay can then be moved around the screen by just changing some timing parameters without having to actually write to any memory. And in fact my system here, the sprite memory is read only, it never needs to be written to at all. The first challenge then is timing, so working out when the VGA coordinates are within the region of the sprite and allowing the location of the sprite to be specified somehow. So rather than just counting pixels, I decided to count horizontal sync pulses first to find the right vertical position on the screen, and then count pixels within each scan line to find the horizontal position. This results in two very similar counting circuits, uh, one for horizontal and one for vertical, each consisting of just a few ICs, and these are enough to determine both whether we're in the right region of the screen and what coordinates should be passed to the sprite memory. So it was nice to be able to do that without having to have another set of counters for the memory address. As I showed in a short recently, I built up a test circuit consisting of just the vertical timing ICs, and I used an Arduino to send pulses to it and measure the outputs to check it was working. This led to refining the circuit a bit, so it was well worth testing on the Arduino on its own, and the counter's initial values are hardwired on the breadboard, but changing those values changes the sprite coordinates. So initially here the Y coordinate relative to the V-Sync is 514, uh, but by changing a few links on the breadboard I can change that to 258, and I can also make the sprite be either 128 or 256 pixels high. So there's a degree of configurability here through, through these links on the breadboard that we are going to have to expose to the CPU later on. I transcribed the circuit to KiCad using the board layout tool to experiment with breadboard layouts a bit, and then extended the circuit by adding the horizontal timings as well, uh, which are very much like the vertical ones, but just driven by different signals. And then I updated the Arduino program to test the horizontal timing as well, as you can see here, and I checked it gave the right output signals, of course. So with that bit of the circuit tested and working properly, it's time to actually hook it up to the real VGA circuit. So here's what we have to start with. On the left over here is the 6502 computer with the VGA circuit connected up to a little monitor. And on the right we have the sprite generator prototype with one row of vertical counters to the left, one row of horizontal counters on the right, and that's currently still hooked up to the Arduino Nano that I was using to test it with. So the main thing I'm going to do now is reconnect it to the VGA circuit's timing signals instead. I'm also going to have to put a little blending circuit in here to merge the existing red, green and blue signals from the VGA circuit with the output from the sprite generator. So let's get started. To begin with, this is a 74HCT157 quad 2 to 1 multiplexer, like the one I used to use in the VGA circuit in the past. And I'll use that to select between the background output and the sprite output for, for four different data channels. It needs power and ground as usual and it has an output enabled that I'll keep permanently active. If my VGA circuit had a blanking output signal, I'd actually connect that here, um, a bit like I did with the SCN 2674s, but it doesn't at the moment, and that's no big deal, so long as I keep the sprite inside the active area and don't clip over the edges, it'll be fine. Next, I can wire the red, green and blue background signals into the A inputs of the multiplexer, and I'll wire the B inputs to the positive rail, so that initially the sprite pixel colour will just come through as white. I'll also wire up some dummy inputs on the fourth channel of the multiplexer that I'm not using right now. And the outputs of the multiplexer can go back to the VGA connector where the other wires were plugged in before. Now I can bring the sprite active signal from the sprite generator over to the multiplexer where it can select between the two channels. And this signal's active high, so when the sprite is active on screen, um, when, we're in the, when we're within that sort of square region, the multiplexer will route the B inputs through to the output, which I think matches the way I hooked up the inputs here. And I can always swap them later on if it's not correct. And I just noticed this whole board doesn't have power and ground at the moment, so I'll just daisy chain that for now. I don't like doing this daisy chaining, I prefer individual boards to get power direct from the power supply through their own wires to isolate the transients a bit. 
but we'll do it like this for now. When I'm prototyping, I often don't follow the best practices, but I keep them in mind to fall back to in case I run into problems later on. Actually, for now, I'm going to disconnect the sprite generator again and just te test the multiplexer on its own. So the sprite is currently wired permanently off through this white wire. I'll turn the computer on again and we get the initial red screen as usual for this current program, which is just the same program I showed on the last video about a month ago. Let's click through to the more interesting pattern. And now I can try enabling the sprite. Uh, I can't just collect the selection line positive because I need it to not be outputting during the blanking. I can't constantly be on. So what I'll do is connect it to the VGA circuit's red output for now. So when the regular VGA circuit tries to output red, we'll actually activate the sprite instead. So, we, so the pixel should come out white. I mean, it's only a very simple bit of circuit there, but it's good to test as you go. And because it's in this program, let's try the Gouldian Finch image as well. Again, it should replace any pixels that contain some red with pure white and it looks like that works, so that's good. So notice that all the yellow was replaced too, because yellow contains red, as well as magenta, but blue, green, and cyan were left alone because they contain no red. So this is important because being able to quickly switch between displaying the background image and the sprite is critical to making masked sprites work well. And all of those little red dots in the background are a great test to make sure that the multiplexer can switch on and off quickly enough. So what's next? Well, we need to get the sprite timing circuit hooked up with the aim of being able to draw a white square over the background image wherever the sprite is configured to be. Um, so I'll connect the select input back to the sprite active output again first. Then over here, the horizontal counters are driven by the VGA clock, which I should be able to get from somewhere. Yep, these shift registers will do as they're already clocked by that. And the vertical counters are driven by the horizontal sync pulse, which is one of these black wires over here. And they're reset by the vertical sync pulse, which is the other black wire over here. This last white wire is the vertical active output from the sprite generator, but that was just for debugging really on the Arduino. I don't need to connect it to anything, so it, that just leaves power on ground, I think. Again, more nasty daisy chaining here. I ought to be taking power straight from the power supply for this whole board. We'll have to see how that goes. So I have a good feeling about this because it tested well on the Arduino, but let's turn it on and see what happens. And that's kind of worked. It's not properly. I can see a region of the screen going white. It looks like it might be 256 pixels wide as expected. Uh, but vertically it's filling the whole screen, so something's wrong with the vertical stuff. So I'll check the V-Sync connection. It looks correct. I mean, the white square went away when I took it out, so that's good. It's odd though, the vertical and horizontal circuits are almost identical, and the horizontal one's working fine, or it seems to be. And I tested them well beforehand, so I don't think there are any wiring areas within those circuits. It has to be to do with the timing signals. In fact, the vertical active signal must be sticking on. This is taken straight from the terminal count output of the most significant vertical counter. So if that's staying on all the time, then that counter must not be counting, because at the very least it ought to turn itself off after 256 scan lines. That's very odd. I'm a bit stumped, unless it's resetting all the time. That's actually a possibility, because I was playing with different resolutions in the actual VGA circuit a few months ago, which have different sync polarity, and I might have left that backwards. Um, so I'll have to check the code and see. And yes, it was backwards in the code. So that would have been causing those three vertical counters to constantly reset to their initial configured values. Um, and in fact, they'd only actually tick up during the scan lines of the V-Sync pulse itself, which is just like two scan lines per frame. So that's that's uh, that's not good. So with that code fixed and reprogrammed in, we get quite a different result, much better overall. Still wrong though. Um, so it looks like the horizontal side of things is working well, except maybe that first line. Vertically, it's also starting in a consistent place, but it seems to be having some issue with its overall duration. It's meant to stay on for 256 scan lines, but it looks more like 128 at the minimum, and it keeps flickering to different amounts. 
So again, this is based on that uh, vertical active output from the vertical timing half of the circuit, um, which is just a counter thing. So it must be that the counters are counting different numbers of lines. And I don't think it could be an issue with the initial values because those are wired straight to the power rails. Um, so I can try changing them though. And yeah, the rectangle moved down the screen. Um, I can change some other bits as well, but really it's not going to be this. It is nice to see it move around though. Let's try horizontally, and that works too. Still some problem with that top line. There's nothing more demanding about these other backdrops. The sprite side of things doesn't really care what's underneath it, but it's nice to see anyway. So zooming in, that top line definitely looks wrong. And looking at the positioning on screen, that start point vertically is nowhere near as low as it's meant to be. Um, so I wonder whether there's some ringing on the VGA clock line or something like that. Because um, it's, it's driving a lot of different ICs now, both in this circuit and the regular VGA one. And there's a really long daisy chaining of wires between the different things that are listening for it. So to tackle that first and foremost, I think I'll try adding decoupling capacitors. As I said earlier, I often skip this sort of thing when prototyping because partly because it's just prototyping, uh, but also partly because I'm genuinely interested in experiencing the problems that can occur if you don't follow these best practices. So this sort of thing is kind of an educational moment for me. It's nice to be learning by doing. So initially I've added capacitors across the power rails in the vicinity of these ICs, which should help to balance the levels on the power and ground lines when they switch. Um, and these counters are switching all the time, some of them at fairly high frequencies, so I really ought to have done this as a matter of course up front. I also added some extra ones to the rest of the circuit, as I was rather stingy with them there too. And the way I'm adding these still isn't best practice, they ought to be as directly as possible across the individual IC's power and ground pins, but I find it very hard to place them like that in a way that's not either very labour intensive or liable to short something out. So that seems to have resolved some of the issues. As you can see, it's not flickering around anymore. It's behaving a lot more consistently. But it's still only half as high as it's meant to be. And that first line is still broken too. And I think it's about half as far down the screen as it's meant to be as well. So, so to explain what I mean a bit, the nice thing about analog video is that you can look at the dimensions of the screen and deduce things about the timing. So this whole display is 640 pixels wide. And I can imagine splitting the screen into five stripes and the sprite seems to occupy the second and third stripes out of those five, and two-fifths of 640 is 256, which is as it's meant to be. Vertically there's about 480 pixels in total, and the sprite looks more like it occupies about a quarter of them, uh, which is about 120 then. So it's probably actually 128 pixels that it's occupying vertically, which is half the height it's meant to be. And the y-coordinate too looks like about 256 here, while the circuit is configured for 512. So 512 is actually technically off the bottom of the screen anyway, so I shouldn't really be passing that in. I'm going to configure it for 128 to check that out, um, so bear with me a moment. And that looks like it's about 64 pixels after the vertical sync ends now, so that is again halving. There's a back porch of about 33 pixels before the ones you can see on the screen here, so that looks about 64 pixels to me. So as it's dividing everything by two, I'm kind of curious what it'll do if we set the Y coordinate to uh, an odd number. So let's try that. It ought to move one pixel down the screen, except with the divide by two, it probably won't do that. And that's interesting. It looks like it's uh, fixed that top line somehow. And maybe that top line offset was actually due to uh, the ringing on the horizontal sync line, because that would kind of make sense. So if every ho horizontal sync pulse was being counted twice, once at the right time and then a second time about it looks like 20 pixels later as a reflection down the wire then maybe that's why that first line moved to the right as well as it was triggered by that second pulse which came in at the wrong time i'm not completely sure but anyway evidence is pointing at the horizontal sync line being suspect um, and as, as i said before all these timing lines are used in lots of different places in the circuit and they're probably overloaded so i'm going to grab some resistors and i'm going to try end terminating it and that means connecting the line to a constant voltage level uh, as close as possible physically to the receiving end of the connection so it's like a parallel resistor at the receiving end 
I don't really know how to calculate what sort of values to use. I've just picked up a couple of methods to try and deal with these things. Um, I might get the oscilloscope out to verify it, but I might just try some and see what works. I'd like to use the largest resistor value I can while still resolving the issue. So I've tried a few resistor values here and I think 3k was too much, the ringing still occurred quite a lot at that level. While 100 ohms was too little, it actually pulled the sync signal too low and broke the monitor's um, syncing. So 470 ohms seems to work fairly well. So that's nice. Um, the sprite region is now exactly where it's meant to be and that top line is no longer being offset. Fantastic. So next up, let's try drawing something more exciting than that white square. The whiteness is coming from the hardwired B inputs to the multiplexer here, as I said before. So the usual trick for a first pass on this kind of thing for me is to wire them to the counter outputs instead so that they change over time. And I have the horizontal ones over here and vertical ones too, and I can wire them over really easily. So let, first let's do one channel. I'll unplug the red B input and let's wire it to ground as a test first, and that's good, the square has gone cyan. So now we can try connecting it to a vertical counter output, and yet we get stripes, which is nice. So let's do green as well then. I'll wire this to a horizontal output instead, and I'll wire blue to another horizontal output. And now we have crisscross stripes, which is great. But there's some instability again. It looks similar to the issues we had before. So let's revisit that termination. So there's another kind of termination we can do here, uh, which is to terminate it at the other end of the connection. We can do, do a source termination. Um, and these are a bit different to end terminations. These go in serial with the signal instead of in parallel to, a, to ground or whatever. And there's a weird effect on the screen when I just disconnect that. It sort of images everywhere. But I'm adding the resistor now. Um, I think this is a 47 ohm resistor I'm trying here. Actually, it looks pretty good. Much more stable image again. And as you can see here, it's a bit of a bodge job on the breadboard. There wasn't any spare breadboard rows to actually plug the resistor into here, so I've just wired it across to the other one. Um, but that's stable again now. So, we're getting there. Next I want to get masking working, so I want to make it so that some of the pixels are transparent and the background shows through. And I'm going to do this based on whether all of the colour channel bits I'm putting out here are zeros, which corresponds currently to black in the current test case. So I need to blend that result with the sprite's own active signal before sending it to the multiplexer. So I'm going to drop down to just two bits of data, uh, like let's say red and green here and I'm going to use a quad NAND to blend everything together. And I did some maths on paper. I think I need to invert both channels, then NAND that result together to get a signal that's low when both inputs are low. And then I can NAND that with the sprite active signal, and I'll get a result then which is low only if the sprite is both active and the pixel is solid. And that'll use all four gates of the quad NAND. And that works nicely. I've got to mention the final output from that NAND gate is inverted compared to the sprite active signal, so I also needed to swap the A and B inputs on the multiplexer. But that's great, all the bits that were black before are now transparent. So let's move swiftly on. As with all my other high resolution video circuits, I'm going to need to split bytes of data up into individual pixels because the frequencies of the individual pixels are too high for the memory ICs I'm using. So I'm going to put them in some shift registers as usual. And as I'm only using two colour channels at the moment, I can use two shift registers, one for each. And I'll just use the top four bits of each shift register to make eight bits in total that will go into this, the kind of memory byte that's being decoded. I won't talk about the details a lot now because I've done this quite a few times recently in other videos. But you can see here I've connected the low bits low as they're unused and I've connected the clock inputs to each other so that they'll tick at the same time and I've connected their reset inputs together as well. The tick inputs then need to be connected to the main VGA clock which I'll foolishly daisy chain again here. And yeah that didn't work well the display's gone all over the place. So I'll add a terminating resistor to this one too like an end termination again. 
and, and that's better. Uh, this isn't doing anything at the moment, but the display is back to normal again now, so it didn't like having that connection made without the terminating resistor. Again, it's not a proper solution. I really need to replan the sourcing and routing of this signal because it's the highest frequency in the circuit and it goes to far too many different destinations at the moment without any proper termination or buffering. Moving on though, let's connect up some of the shift register input to the counter outputs. Um, so then we'll get the usual kind of binary counting pattern on the screen, I hope. So I'll connect the horizontal bits to the left shift register and the vertical bits to the right one. That's left and right from my perspective, not from the cameras. Oh, and that reset line needs to just be held high. And as usual, the parallel enable lines are annoying because I need them to go low for just one out of every four pixels. Um, I'm just going to use one of the counter outputs for now, which isn't correct, but it will at least do something. And that does produce the right kind of pattern on the screen. Um, let's go back and do something proper with the parallel enable pins though, because it's too hard to make sense of that. So I already designed this bit of circuit on paper, and I think what I can do is use an OR gate to make them go low only when the two lowest horizontal counter bits are low, and I can replace the rest of the NAND circuit from before with just one more OR gate. The entire NAND circuit can boil down to just one OR gate now, uh, blending the two outputs from the shift registers so if they're both non-zero, so, sorry, if either of them is non-zero, then um, the OR gate will output non-zero as well. So to make it also go low when the sprite is not actually active, when we're not within that square region on the screen, I'm going to connect the shift register's reset pins to the sprite active signal. So when the sprite is not active, the shift registers will just output low because they're in the reset state um, and it will get interpreters transparent. This also means the multiplexer is backwards again, so I need to swap all its connections right, right around to the to the way they were before. So that is working a lot better, pretty much completely as expected. On the breadboard, you can see uh, the two low horizontal counter bits going to the OR gate here, and the result of that drives the parallel enable on the shift registers. And over here is the red and green color bits being ORed together to drive the multiplexer now. So I don't know how much further I'm going to take this circuit today, because this is probably getting kind of long. Um, but just like I showed recently with the text output on the SCN2674, the next step is going to be adding an EEPROM containing sprite image data, uh, wiring the counter outputs to its address pins, and wiring the shift register inputs to the EEPROM's outputs instead. I'll, I also need to figure out what I want to put in the EEPROM. At 256 by 256, I'll need 14 bits of address line data to address the whole sprite. So a regular 32K EEPROM will be able to store just two frames. Um, it strikes me that if I use a larger chip, I can store more frames. And I think I have some 64K EEPROMs, so I could use one of those. I learned enough about Blender to create something a bit like the Amiga bouncing boing ball, I think it's called, demo sprite. Um, and output four frames of animation for it. And I believe the Amiga demo actually used pallet cycling rather than separate frames for the animation, but I'm going to do it this way instead because that's what my circuit supports. Um, the individual frames are then packed into a ROM image in the same way I've done for other images in the past, like the Gouldian Finch image through kind of Python scripts and things like that. And in the circuit, it's wired up pretty much as you'd expect. Counters driving address lines and data outputs driving shift register inputs. And I haven't connected up the address pins for the animation yet, uh, so it's just a static image at the moment. To drive those properly, I, I'm going to need some kind of frame counter or something similar, I think. So before we get to that, though, let's quickly look on the other backgrounds. So resetting, we have the ball on the red background. There's a bit of flickering on the right-hand side here. Not on the pattern background, that looks a lot worse. There seems to be quite a lot of holes in the image. It could be a timing issue with the EEPROM, maybe. Uh, the relative timing of the shift register parallel enable pins and their clocks and the EPROM address line changes, they might all be changing on top of each other or something like that. I'll come back to that later. I think I'm going to add a counter now, counting frames, so that I can see the animation. Um, I can't just use the existing counters because they just count up within a frame. I need, a, I need something that counts actual frames now. Um, so it's fairly straightforward. I won't talk through it. I'll just go ahead and wire it up.
There's one. And there's the other. Nice. The monitor doesn't seem to like it very much, but it is spinning there. I can try a slower speed. And that's a bit better. I think I can go much slower again too. And that starts to look a bit jerky now. And the monitor's having trouble changing from red to green outputs. Um, it's not a great monitor, this one. It's just a little 7-inch thing I use for this. It won't have the best response time. Anyway, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, I can also see that there's a bit of a dark shadow to the right of the ball and not to the left. And I think that is uh, due to a delay in the select line that goes to the multiplexer, causing it to swap to the background data a little bit late on the right-hand side of the image. The universal fix for this is probably going to be another layer of latching on the outputs. But I won't bother with that today. Um, that'll come later. I might do I might do some kind of palette swapping on the outputs as well at the same time as that. So the next step, maybe the final one, will be to actually get the 6502 involved because it's not really doing very much at the moment. It's drawing all these background images, uh, but the sprite's position is hardwired into the circuit, and the animation is just driven by the frame counter here. So the 6502 has really got nothing to do with the sprites here at the moment. But it's not too hard to hook it up to the 6502, so I might go ahead and do that now. It just needs some registers to latch data into, which will then feed the counters instead of having them hardwired on, like they are on the breadboard. So yeah, I'll go ahead with that. I've got some registers, I think. So I've added the three uh, 74HC 574 registers now. I need to give them power and ground, and then I'll wire the output enable permanently active as well. They have a clock pulse pin to control the latching. Um, in order to get different data into each register, I could drive their clock pins independently of each other. But I want to try a different trick here, I think, that I saw in an old ARM evaluation system circuit from the 80s. I'm going to clock all three simultaneously um, and wire them in a chain with the outputs of the first one providing inputs to the second one and the outputs of the second one providing inputs to the third one. I'd better put a circuit diagram up to explain that, I guess. It should end up working like a three-stage shift register, with, but, but with eight bits of width in each stage. In a sense, actually, it's a bit like eight three-bit shift registers. I don't know. You can think of it however you want. This means the CPU won't be able to update just one register at a time, uh, but that's okay. We can just reload all three at once each time we need to make a change. They're probably all going to change at the same time anyway. And ideally, it won't be at a point where the sprite circuit is actually using their data. We can use software to time that. So let's get all these chained inputs and outputs wired up. I've also connected the clock pulse pin for the latches or flip-flops here to CB2 on the 6522VIA. And this is a handshake output which I can configure to send a single clock pulse going low followed by high after each write I make to port B. Um, and I'll only turn this feature on when I want to send data to the sprite registers, which means I can keep using port B for the LCD and as a bank register for the rest of the VGA circuit without interfering with the sprites. So when I want to change the sprite registers, I turn this behavior on, then I send my three bytes to port B, and then I turn this behavior off again. So now I can connect port B all the way over to the inputs uh, to the first register here. And before connecting all the counter inputs up, I'm going to see if the CPU is correctly driving the animation frame selector by disconnecting that from the temporary counter I added earlier. And that does seem to work. Fantastic. So I'll unwire the counters from the power rails and start wiring them through to the right bits of the registers, starting with the vertical one. And that's definitely doing something. You can see on the screen, it's not exactly what I wanted. Oh, I haven't connected all the bits yet. I left off the top two. So let's try with them connected too. Hmm. Still not really working. So I'm wondering... So I'm wondering how badly I got this wrong and where. I'll tell you what though, I'm going to wire up the horizontal counters and figure, then figure out what's wrong uh, and come back just with the solution as this is already going to be quite a long video I think. I already have three hours of footage to edit together later on. So I'll be back with an update when it's working.
and here we are all looking good. This is all being driven by the CPU now. I had a few problems with what I did earlier on. There were some nasty bugs in the code. Uh, I think trying to make the ball bounce backwards and forwards and up and down with gravity all in one go uh, without testing it in any way um, it was a mistake. I should have done something simpler first. Uh, and I also had some of the connections wrong on the third register, which um, which has several fields merged into one. So it's important that the different uh, things reading from that are actually connected to the right bits. So I think that's going to be the final circuit for this video, though. Um, I'm not, still not sure whether this is too much for one video, so I might cut it in the middle. But if it is one video and you've stuck around, thanks for your interest if you stuck with it. And I hope some of the trials and tribulations along the way were interesting. Um, and my mind's a bit frazzled now though, so I'm not sure what's next here. Probably thinking about how to make more than one sprite work together without having to replicate this entire circuit for every single sprite. But that's definitely for another day now.